You are listening to the Let Me Overthink About It podcast, where I dive into a series of topics that occupy my anxious mind. I'm Sam Adore, overthinker extraordinaire. This week, I'm overthinking about living with trauma with Mandy Wood. And a trigger warning to all of my listeners, this episode will include conversations around childhood sexual assault. Mandy has been a radio broadcaster for over 20 years here in Toronto, Nova Scotia. She's been very open about her mental health struggles, as well as her childhood trauma. And I'm so grateful that she sat down with me to have a chat. Here it is. I am here with Mandy Wood. Hello, Mandy. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm excited to have this chat. Uh, We're actually recording this on Easter weekend. So also, I appreciate you taking time away from your kiddos. (laughs) Or maybe this is welcome time. It's a bit of a welcome break (laughs) because they are a little anxious or rather excited for the bunny, I guess. So yes. Oh, that's bouncing hilarious. off the walls. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We just before we started recording, we're talking about our love of Mr. Munchies. Yes. The, the best of the Easter bunnies. Right. Hands down. Yeah. The, it's the Rice crispy that really. And remember when it. we were children, you could get the one pound crispy bunny. Oh my God. Yeah. I got one, just the one Easter. Yeah. Favorite Easter ever. Right. Well, that in the year I got the Walkman. <laughs> Not to date myself, man. Yeah, there might be some viewers. I mean, I think a lot of people who listen are like our generation or older, <laughs> but I, but you never know. Some people might have to Google that. And this was a Walkman that didn't have rewind. This was one of the first. Oh, man. How exciting was that? Oh, yeah. No. Memories. I love it. Well, thank you so much. And I want to also thank you off the top because I know you're somebody who is very open about your mental health struggles. Mm-hmm. And I think being on the radio in particular, being a public figure. I was going to say face, but people know your voice before they know your face. (laughs) Um, It's so important to have folks who have that courage to speak and tell their stories publicly. So thank you for for being an advocate. Oh, well, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, it's just, and you know, I I feel like when we talk about, because I know, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I know you had a period where you left work. Yes, um, I was off work for almost two years. Was it almost? Oh my it goodness. was from June of 2020. I think June 16th, 2020 was my last shift at work. Yeah. And I didn't return to work until near the end of March of oh 2022. My oh my goodness. Yes. And even then it wasn't, I wasn't full time again until June of 2022. Right. Right. So you can't, you kind of eased your way back in. Yeah, I had, I worked with a wonderful um, case manager. Uh, for the back to work, integrating me back into work, getting used to it, starting out just a couple of days a week at reduced hours and then building back up to full time to make sure that, you know, while I felt it was the right time to return to work, my doctor, my psychologist, just make sure it really was yeah. the right time to get back and ease into it. Oh, man. And so my point in bringing that up is to say, how great is it to be able to openly say that that's why you were off work? For your mental health to openly talk about that I, i'm saying this because i'm i was talking on twitter <laughs> uh just in case you're wondering um but then also to have an organization that you work for who's able to support that and to have those important conversations about coming back and easing back in well i will say and i'll even name drop my <laughs> my direct manager chris Van Tassel. Oh, I love Chris Van Tassel. He's been amazing the entire time. I've had mental health issues my entire life. Yes. And while the stretch from 2020 to 2022 is the only time I took a formal absence from work, I struggled heavily with my mental health in my mid-20s when I was employed at the radio station. Mm -hmm. Chris was my boss. And my depression at that time was manifesting as panic attacks. Oh, and it's kind of funny because the first time I had one, I thought I was having an asthma attack. Mm-hmm. Did you know that if you take your Ventolin puffer, you don't need to? Really bad things can happen. Are you serious? <laughs> My heart started racing. And so it turned out you actually b- basically made your panic attack worse. Well, yeah, by... because I thought I was yeah. having an asthma attack. Right. I had never had a panic attack before, so yeah. I had no experience with this. And so I assumed I couldn't catch my breath because I couldn't breathe because of asthma. Right. So I you know, take a couple hauls off a puffer. No, no, it turned out it was a panic attack. And that's how my depression, that's how my doctor had explained it to me later. Well, that's how my depression was manifesting itself in the form of panic attacks. So there were times newscasts got missed. Because at the time, my primary role at the station was news. Right. 
And my boss was extremely accommodating. Chris would try to talk me down through those periods. He would tell me, look, if you need some time off, you have it. You don't have anything to Let's worry about. Let's date this. Okay. That what year would this have been? 2005? Because that's 2006. key to this story because conversations like that weren't happening then, Mandy. Would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. If yeah. you had any type of mental illness, you were not talking about it. Yeah. To be labeled with a mental illness? Yeah. Career damaging? Totally. Personal relationship damaging? Yeah. So much stigma. So much comes with that. Yeah. And you know what? I probably at the time wouldn't have even referred to it as mental illness. You would have just said I have panic attacks. I Exactly. Yeah. I have anxiety. Or yes. Yeah. I have panic attacks. And he was extremely encouraging, accommodating. And at the time, you know what? Probably because I didn't, I probably had the same stigmas and the same misconceptions about mental illness. No, I don't need to take time off work. Even though... In all of my downtime, I was literally hiding in my apartment, blinds drawn, and I knew I was going to do that for my days off. I would yeah. prepare. At the time, I was a smoker, so I'd make sure I had a couple packs of smokes. I'd have any food I needed. So I did not have to leave that apartment yeah. for 48 hours. And I wouldn't. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't recognize at the time that... That was just your normal. It was. It was my normal. Yeah. I'm just tired. I'm just run down. I just need a break from people. Yeah. And I didn't realize how severe it was until I got the panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And then it was interfering with my work. Right. And I couldn't hide it anymore. Yeah. That is the only reason I ended up getting help that first time is because wow. I can't hide it anymore. Yeah. Wow. And that first panic attack, going back to that, uh, I can very distinctly remember my first really bad panic attack. Mm -hmm. It is actually terrifying. They are. And the thing is, when you have panic attacks, you don't have a panic attack in the exact same way every single time. No. Because after that initial panic attack where I took the puffer, yeah. I did have panic attacks like that one. Right. But then a couple of years later, I was sitting at home. My husband was working back shift. And I was home alone. This was before the kids. And I started losing feeling in my extremities, first in my legs then my arms, and the heavy feeling in my chest. Yeah. I'm clearly obese, always have been. I assumed I'm having a heart attack. Right. And so I went to Emerge. I, I called my husband. He came home. He, he drove me to Emerge. They hooked me up to the machines. Nothing wrong with your heart. It's a panic attack. Right. And so that's the thing. Even if you become used to panic attacks, they may they manifest in different ways. Exactly. Yeah. It'll throw a wrench at you. Be like, oh, you think you're ready for panic attack? Well, here's one you've never had before. And I think the physical response to panic attacks is the most shocking piece because of, um, I, my, for me, it's always a stroke. I have a history of stroke. My grandmother had strokes. Mm -hmm. And so I think to myself, I'm having a stroke. Um, so I think for me, it's the physical side that you don't really think exists in a panic attack. Like if you're like describing a panic attack, you wouldn't assume because it's a mental thing that exactly. there's a physical component to it. But there is. And it's extremely scary. It is. There have been a couple of panic attacks where I thought I was actually dying. Yeah. yeah. And it's. And the thing you need to get yourself through it is the thing that's working against you. Yes. <laughs> Right. And that's the biggest thing with mental illness is that your brain works against you. Yeah. Your brain lies to you. Yeah. When you're in the thick of it, when you are in the worst of a mental illness episode, a mental illness crisis, and that's what I'll call 2020. It was a mental health crisis. Yeah. And I didn't think I was ever going to come out of it. Mm. But your brain, when you're in the worst of it, will lie to you and tell you that, you know what, this is how you deserve to live. You don't deserve to be happy. Yeah. You don't deserve to feel safe. You don't deserve to not have panic attacks constantly. Yeah. Your brain will lie to you, but you do deserve these things. Everyone does. And for the majority of people, you can achieve these things yeah. with the proper help. Right. Which is different for everyone. Not everything works for everyone. Yes. Um, but you do have to trust the process because when you get into treatment for mental illness, 
you are going to have some really good moments, mm -hmm. maybe some really good days, and you're going to have some setbacks, and those are extremely hard. Yeah. Because the first thought in your head is, I thought I was getting better. Right. And, and then now you're I'm not. yourself up because you're not able to even get better or even trust that you were exactly. getting better. Exactly. Exactly. So then you doubt everything about yourself, your capability of even getting better. Yeah. That any of the work that you've done has been any benefit when it has. And it's okay to have those bad moments, bad days, bad weeks. Yeah. It is okay. It's part of the process. Yeah. I still have terrible days. Yeah. I still see a psychologist every two weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm still constantly doing therapy. And this is something that I'm going to have to do for the rest of my life. The same as I have to manage my diabetes. Right. I have to manage my mental health. Yeah. Oh, man. When my doctor put it in terms like that, because I have endometriosis. And so I was literally oh, at my goodness, doctor. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I was at my doctor for to both of those things, mm -hmm. for endometriosis and for my, it was the first time I was actually, she was telling me, you are depressed. Like this, what you're telling me that can't like help with you your are. mental health either. It does not at all. And when she, when I very easily took the prescription for the anaprox that was going to help with my endometriosis, but then struggled to take the prescription for these, you know, antidepressants that she wanted to put me on, she made it very clear in that moment to me, like you're, you're not questioning this for your physical illness, but you're questioning it for your mental illness. And that can be a lot to get over and get around. 100%. And it certainly doesn't help it if you are in an environment with a lot of closed-minded people who aren't willing to open up themselves to, you know, they still think of mental illness in the term of crazies and straitjackets yeah. and, you know, two men in coats coming to get people, right? <laughs> I'm laughing, but... No, but those but are it stereotypes that, right. yeah. that you saw in movies and lobotomies and things, and that's yeah. what mental illness is to them. And no, that's not what mental illness is, really. Yes. <laughs> but I think you made a good point earlier, too, Mandy, is that we have our own stigmas. We do, right? We so do. that's the issue at the beginning, is you're not only fighting against how you assume other people, how you assume, say, Chris, for example, mm -hmm. your boss is going to respond if I say this. And that was difficult. Right? That was difficult, because this was my first job in the industry. Yeah. And so it's been the only one. But yeah. it's the first job in the industry, and so I'm still very young. Yeah. And so I don't know what's going to happen if yeah. I step forward and and admit this vulnerability, because that's what it is. 100%. It's a vulnerability, because the, the thing that happens is when you mention that you have mental health issues, you have mental illness, some people just assume that... Perhaps I worried, I suppose, that people might not take me as a news person as seriously because I have mental illness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That that was somehow going to ruin my credibility as a reporter, as a news reader, news presenter. And so that's going through my head. And a lot of us have a hard time. It's a it's a quote that I heard a number of years ago that Europeans work to live. North Americans live to work. And so you're very work focused. Yeah. And so you're very worried about doing anything that is going to disrupt the balance of your work life. And so it was extremely intimidating and scary. But like I said, Chris was extremely, extremely supportive. Yeah. And he has been the entire time, which is, amazing. and he was in 2020 as well. Yeah. And he still checks in and asks how I'm doing every now and then. So any any business owners or bosses who are listening that is such a key. that's the way to do it that's the way to do it to listen i know chris's ears are burning right now but that is <laughs> that's the way to do it because it could have very easily been like you said the opposite of that and then where do you end i could up? have been ostracized exactly right yeah. and that would have done absolutely nothing for my mental health yeah that would have just proved the lies to me and that would have, I would have just continued to swirl in that negativity with yeah. those thoughts. And I don't know how I would have come out of that had I got a different response from my manager. Right. And so I think that's key for employers. Yeah. It's not just how it's going to affect them at their job. What you're saying to them, if they come to you talking about their mental illness or they're having some mental health issues, that's going to impact them 24-7. Yes. Not just how they're going to do the job for you. Yeah. So that's where the overthinking important. comes in. Oh my gosh. And I'm the queen of it. The queen is 
right? You're going to dwell on that. Mm-hmm. Whatever the outcome is or whatever the re- reaction is that you get from that person, you're going to dwell on that. So, and whether they realize that or not, and do- I doubt they do unless they're an overthinker themselves, but <laughs> even still, they probably wouldn't realize. But even with such a positive response, yes. I constantly worried yeah. that every little slip up. Yeah. Or was I going to be watched extra closely? Are people writing things down, keeping a record of these little slip ups so that they can find a more PC way to get rid of me? And those thoughts go in your head. Nobody was doing that. As I said, I had so much support. Yeah. But those thoughts go in your head. And that's a lot of dealing with your mental illness is you have to change your thinking as well. The hardest thing to do. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. I'm a work in progress. I'm yeah. under construction. Yeah. Still trying to do that. We all need thoughts. a t-shirt under yeah. construction. I love that. <laughs> I need like a whole wardrobe of under construction. <laughs> but um no, the the it's the hardest part, I think, for the for my mental illness journey is trying to retrain myself in the way that I think. Mm-hmm. And because your brain's talking again, working against you. That, and that's exactly right. With yeah. mental illness, your brain is working against you. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but it's the most important thing in your body. So that makes the fight extra hard because yeah. it is literally battling you. Yeah. And you're trying to battle it. How do you fix the thing that's working against you with the thing that's working against you? It's extremely <laughs> difficult. That's for sure. Uh, Since my mental health crisis in June of 2020, I've taken a number of different types of therapy. I do uh, CBT with my psychologist on a regular basis, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I've done ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy with um, Dr. Kirkpatrick out of Halifax. Okay, I've never heard of this. It was a wonderful program that I did with her. It was a group therapy setting. Which scared the heck out of me oh, to begin with. Yeah. Right. It's, even you saying group therapy gave me clammy hands. <laughs> because I had turned down group therapy options before. Yeah. And no, like it took me a long time to talk to my psychologist one on one. What do right. you mean you want me in a group with 10 people yeah. talking about Is things? Is that the size? It was a 10 person group. And then you had Dr. Kirkpatrick. And, um, so I was terrified, but this was the only way it was being done because this was 2020, right? No one was meeting. Oh, right. This was December of 2020 when I started this therapy. And the only reason I agreed to it is because it was out of Halifax. So I assumed she didn't have too many local patients mm-hmm. because I don't want to, I'm not a celebrity, but some people recognize me as Mandy from the radio. Yeah. So I didn't want to be Mandy from the radio Yeah. in the group. That's right. Yeah. Right. I just want it to be another patient. Right. And as soon as you open your mouth and speak in Truro, people recognize your voice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I I didn't want that. Yeah. Right. And it's not that I'm I'm very open. Yeah. I'm very open. It's just okay. a different experience, though. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's a vulnerability. You may not be prepared to share with too many people. Yeah. But oh, my goodness. Group therapy was amazing for me. Wow. So not only the instruction and the guidance of the psychiatrist going through this therapy, but the actual interacting with the other people. And some of us actually formed a Facebook group afterwards, our little tribe to help each other out when we were having mental health issues. And I'm still in touch with a few of them, even though I haven't done the therapy in three years. Yeah. But um, that was a wonderful program. And for anyone who needs to deal with trauma, PTSD, addictions, things like that, I would recommend seeking safety through the mental health unit at the Colchester East Hands Health Center. Okay. I took that in the summer of 2021. And I didn't, I I have a very traumatic background. There's lots of traumas in my life. Uh, The most recent traumas, aside from my mental uh, illness crisis in 2020, would probably be the birth of my twins. Mm -hmm. There was a lot associated with that. But I have a lot of childhood traumas, prolonged childhood sexual abuse, extreme poverty. To say my parents' relationship was dysfunctional is to put it mildly. Right. And so I have CPTSD, complex PTSD. Okay. And the Seeking Safety Program helped me not only recognize some of my triggers, Mm -hmm. but why I respond in certain situations the way that I do. And it's also a great program for somebody with self-harm. I have a history of self-harm. 
And that's why I was recommended for the program, that and the PTSD. But it helps you manage your triggers better. Helps you figure out what your triggers are, why you're reacting that way. And the calming exercises and the grounding exercises I still use to this day. And that is the gift, right? Two things the connections that you made and yes. that you can still pull from of people who get it. You don't have to start from scratch telling your story. They know who you are. And exactly. You can just pick up where you left off. And also that those tips and tools that you can pull from still. And I can't remember, I can't remember from which therapy this came from, but what it is, it's basically everyone has a toolbox. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, some of us, we're supposed to be plumbers, but we have the tools for an electrician in the box. So we can't oh, do I much. love this analogy. So we can't do much as a plumber. The thing is, we need the right tools in there. And that's what therapy does. It gives you the right tools in your toolbox. It's yeah. not going to fix it for you, yeah. but it gives you the tools to fix it. Right. So that you can do it appropriately. And the next time, five years down the exactly. road when it happens again. You'll know. You have a basis like, okay, so this is what happened last time. Yeah. I've got to dig in that box and get those tools out again. We can fix it this time. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And one thing that you have been open as well about, Mandy, is is the trauma around your childhood. Yes. And was that the, and I want to preface this by saying there doesn't have to be a trigger <laughs> for any mental health struggle that you have. If you're, if you're born with depression, you mm -hmm. have depression. Um, but do you think that in 2020, that was what brought up this especially difficult? Some of it, time? but I had started to notice a decline in my mental health in 2019. Okay. And a couple of rather significant things happened to me in 2019. I lost my grandmother mm -hmm. um, in January of that year, just less than two weeks before her 81st birthday. Mm -hmm. And then my cat, <laughs> which I realized to some people that seems silly, but I had Mocha for 18 years. She was my baby. And Listen, you're in good company <laughs> because lots of a pet, and I have this conversation a lot, that grief that you feel from that unconditional, 100% unconditional love that you get from a pet is just incomparable. Not to mention, I had mocha during my mental health difficulties in my mid-20s. She early was with mid through. Exactly. She was with me in that apartment for the 48 hours in the dark, curled up next to me. Or if I was lying down, she was on my back. Yes. Right. And so that was hard to take. And then, of course, 2020 was hard for everyone. Yeah. You have COVID. You had the mass shooting, which hit me a lot harder than I thought it would. Well, and you had to be reporting that. And that was difficult. Yeah. And, I, and I, I've always had trouble expressing that because I don't want to take away my trauma around the mass shooting is nothing compared to the victims and their families. And I'm not trying to do, not trying to compare it. No. no. But there is some trauma to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the disappearance of Dylan Ehler. Mm -hmm. Same age as my kids. I cried for a week straight. Yeah. Because that little boy wasn't getting tucked in at night like my kids were. Sorry, yeah, it's still no, hard. It is, yeah. And and my father, I've been estranged from my father since, since March of 2016. And um, he had sexually abused me as a child. And he started reaching out to me with letters from prison in 2019. And then because of COVID, he was released early mm -hmm. and was living in Salmon River at the time. So only a few minutes away okay. from me. Yeah. And so then I started. I'm very familiar. My father was in and out of prison when I was a kid. So I'm very familiar with how um, parole works. And so I would and house arrest. So I was like, okay, he'll be on house arrest. He'll have a few hours on a Saturday. I'm not going to town. Right. Because he'll, that's his, he'll have a few hours on a Saturday to go run errands. And you might run into him. Exactly. And I don't want to see him. I wouldn't let my kids play in the front lawn. I would on the, in the front lawn on Saturdays. Right. Because not that I was worried he was going to come do something to them, but I don't want him to know anything about them. Yeah. And it really bothered me in one of his letters. He mentioned them by name, mm -hmm. which I mean, I talk about them on the radio. So, You're right. you know, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but he had reached out to me and then him living closer. That all just kind of snowballed. And then January, the afternoon of June 16th of 2020, I was sitting in my living room 
And then I just, I got up out of the chair and I ran out of my house screaming, I can't do this anymore. I ran out back in the corner between the privacy panel on our patio out back in the house. And I just kept banging my head against the side of the stucco house. I ended up giving myself a concussion. Oh my gosh, Mandy. Um, and I took a, a solar stake, a stake for a solar light out of the ground. And I was trying to slice my arm. Not, it wasn't a suicide attempt. It was self-harm. I used to cut my arm right. a lot. Yeah. But it just wasn't working because it wasn't sharp enough. It freaked my husband so much. He immediately took the kids out of the house, took them to his parents. Mm. And I called my boss. I don't know how he even understood how I, what I said, but I said, I need a personal day tomorrow. Yeah. He just said, fine. And I called my doctor. He's like, you need to, you need to go off now. He had been trying to convince me, mm -hmm. but for this me, was, this was the, the breaking point. Yes. Yeah. I finally realized I couldn't even do that right now. But originally it was the reason I had fought going off work. If I don't get out of the house to go to work, I might not come out of the house. That was my fear. But with COVID, I had started working from home the latter part of March. Right. So I didn't have that escape anymore. Yeah. And things just kept snowballing and snowballing. Some of it for me was medication in 2020. And the only way I've been able to describe it is sometimes my brain would get loud. Mm -hmm. It's like when you walk into a restaurant or a bar and there's a lot of noise, but you can't hear what anybody's saying, but you can tell everyone is speaking. Right. It's that white noise. And it, I couldn't focus on anything. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do anything. And I couldn't make, make it stop. Yeah. I would just have to try to ride through it. And it turns out that the medication I was on was playing a bit of a role there because as soon as I got weaned off that, that aspect of it stopped. Right. However, I was still suffering from. Panic attacks wasn't the big thing this time, mm -hmm. which was odd for me because, as I that, mentioned, that's yeah. how it manifested in the past. Yeah. It was a combination of medication, but it was also, it also had to do with, you know, some unresolved traumas. I had never done therapy before 2019. I had only started therapy in 2019. Okay. Your, basically, your schedule was revolving around trying to avoid when your father might be out in town and... I just can't imagine how that plays on your mental health. Well, there's always been an element of control by my father over my life. Right. I've always felt that. And some of that has had to do with the fact that I spent most of my life embarrassed of my father. Right. I mean, when Being I was in prison. And, exactly. Yeah. So even if you took the sexual abuse out. Yes. Which that's a heavy thing to take out. But let's say we'll, we'll take that out of the equation. He was in and out of prison a lot. Uh, he didn't hold down work very often. His drinking with his friends was a priority. Right. Um, he wasn't a very good parent. Mm -hmm. And he certainly was not a very good partner to my mother. Right. And so there's always been a certain amount of control that he's had on my life in terms of even as a child, I didn't want to be recognized as his daughter mm -hmm. because that's how I got treated. Right. Um, he was no good. So I, I, there were kids when I was in elementary school who told me they weren't allowed to play with me because my dad was bad. So this, so he uh -huh. had an impact on my entire life. And so, you know, it was keep the fact he's in prison secret. Yeah. Although I grew up in very rural Hans County. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, can't tell people how poor we are. Mm -hmm. and things like, so there's a lot of secret keeping. Yes. And Secret keeping is a way of control. Yeah. And so when I finally cut myself off from my father in 2016, which is something that a lot of people struggle with, he walked me down the aisle at my wedding in 2010. Well, why would you let your abuser do that? Right. Because your dad walks you down the aisle. So how am I supposed to maintain this facade of normalcy if my dad doesn't walk me down the aisle? Right. Or if my dad's not on the wedding invitation. Right. Because then that opens the door for other questions that you're not. Why isn't he answer. walking you down the aisle? Yeah. And I wasn't prepared to come up with that because the first person that I had ever told in any type of detail would have been my psychologist in 2019. I had alluded probably the previous 
10 years that something had happened because my father was convicted of sexually assaulting a minor in the early 2000s. Okay. Which is probably what prompted my mental health issues in my early 20s in the mid 2000s. Yes. In the early to mid 2000s. And so basically by maintaining that facade, I'm keeping it secret. I'm keeping the questions away. Yeah. And because I'm from a very rural area, basically people don't say a lot to your face. They talk about you, but they don't do it to your face a whole lot. So everybody helps maintain this facade of fake life, rainbow and (laughs) sunshine and flowers and everything is hunky dory. But it wasn't the case. And it just kept weighing on me and weighing on me. And over the years, because I had believed after the 2003 conviction, I believed that he had actually changed. Mm-hmm. And now I'll be perfectly honest, I still wouldn't have trusted him around children. And I had told a parole sure. officer that in one of the discussions. But I believed he had changed. But then I, I had started to see probably around 2011 or so, 2012, he had lost his job. Mm-hmm. And then it was the father I knew. Everything is everyone else's fault. Right. And he lost his job because he wasn't supposed to be around any place where children are. And he was caught by a school. And so that's when his employer had found out he wasn't supposed to be. Right. And they had him working in schools at the time. Oh, my goodness. And because he hadn't disclosed his past. Right. Now, these would have been after hours because he was in asbestos removal. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But they're not. But still. Yes, yeah. And so he was let go. And of course, that was everyone else's fault but his. Yeah. Even though he had no reason to be where he was found. Right. And then his partner at the time, who wasn't aware of his background, even though he had told us that she was, mm-hmm. um, she was working in a minimum wage job trying to support them in her friend of her son. He wouldn't get anything except for what was in his field because he's too good for that. Right. And I remember visiting one time at his apartment in Halifax, and there was a bunch of garbage sitting by the door. And it was his partner's son's turn to take the garbage down, but he didn't. So my father is, I don't know, acting like my seven-year-olds would. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not doing it. It's not my turn. So who ended up doing it? His partner with gout, cobbling it down from their third floor apartment. And so I started seeing that selfishness. Yeah. And all of those signs. So every time I would see a historical sexual assault release come from Halifax Regional Police or from West Hants or East Hants, I swear my heart would stop before I would open it. And so every time I would open these releases, because I still work in the newsroom, so I'm You're getting reading these media releases yeah. and we have a newswire service. And so... I keep opening these releases, and then in March of 2016, he was in one. Right. He had breached his conditions again, and I said, that's it, I'm done. I can't. No. Especially with kids. And and this was before my children. Right. But still, it was like, I just can't do this. I can't. I can't live in fear of opening releases at work. Yeah. Because I never wrote up or read those stories. I would leave them for, for James, my coworker. Yes. So they would still get covered. But I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I just could not. And I had been talking to my husband about it for a couple of years, how when I would call my father or visit my father, it just felt it's an obligation. That's what you're supposed to do. Yes. And I had been talking to him about cutting off that relationship. And he had had a heart attack. My father had had a heart attack. In January, February of 2016. And I remember when his partner called, my first thought was, why couldn't he have just died? Mm. And then he's not my dad anymore. And I don't have to worry about it. Right. He can't hurt anybody. I don't have to worry about anything coming up out of the past. So hard. And then in 2021, I decided to bring up the past myself. Right. <laughs> You're like, you know what? And you got to live in fear of someone else bringing it up. <laughs> Well, no, I had been doing therapy and I just felt, you know what, maybe, maybe it was time to go to the police and, and bring up and uh, see what, where we were going to go with this, that maybe I needed to do that for my peace of mind. 
And so because in the past he hadn't been in prison because of abusing you. No. That was no. never that had never come public to life. information. No. Gotcha. So this in 2019 was the first time that it was uh, 2021. 2021. I went to, sorry. I went to the uh West Hans RC. I phoned Windsor RCMP, uh West Hans RCMP in uh, mid-January 2021. And I went in the next day to do an interview with an officer, and that's when I disclosed the approximately five, five and a half years of sexual abuse from the age of about five to ten and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, and from there, uh, four other victims ended up coming forward. And so there were five in total when charges were laid later. Right. And a total of 41 charges laid against him in 2021. I think it was June, I think, when the release came out. Right. And so he's back in prison. He is. Yes. And so how does that, my, and this is such a big question, but how does that all play on your mental wellness? as somebody who already struggles, obviously we've chatted about that with depression and anxiety and panic attacks and all of those things. How does it affect you negatively, but also how does it affect your mental wellness positively, if that's a fair question to ask? No, that's certainly a fair question. To be honest, I don't know. Right. I'm still working through that. Part of me thinks that perhaps it was a bad idea. Okay. Because I've actually found my mental health has been suffering since the sentencing or rather the conviction last year. The conviction would have been, I believe, in May of okay. 2023. Yeah. And he was convicted on 18 of the charges. Oh my God, Mandy. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's a good thing. The conviction, the, thing. Good, the conviction is a good thing, but I just mean of the, the scope. Yeah. yeah. And, and then he was sentenced to 23 years last November, but with time served, just a little over 20. Okay. And uh, so that's quite a sentence. Yeah. Uh, the Crown Attorney, he had said he believed it was the longest uh, sentence for, for that type of se historical sexual assault. Okay. Because there have been some recent changes and rulings right. in the courts over the past couple of years that have allowed for stiffer sentences. And so, Thank heavens. So, yeah, he was sentenced to 23 right. years. Okay. And, and so you're just not sure if... Well, here's the thing. I'm not surprised by anything that he did during the court process. Right. But oh my God, I'm pissed off. I want to thank you for sharing your story today. Um, and I know it's not easy to have these conversations. And I just want to say, I hope that anyone listening who, you know, that brought things up for them is please, please, please find someone to talk to and, and, um, and try to find some support and help because it happens more than we realize and it's not easy to have these conversations but it's also not easy living with through that you have to be your biggest advocate during your hardest time totally and that i think is the most challenging thing about treatment for mental illness it's because you just don't even want to look there are days you don't want to get out of bed there are days brushing your teeth is your win for the day yeah okay and you know what there are days you don't even have that yeah how are you supposed to get on the phone make a bunch of phone calls, send a bunch of emails, or go where, you know, we can go places now. It's not June 2020. Yeah, right. You know, go and knock on doors and try and get answers. That's the last thing you feel like doing, but you have to. It really is worth it. Um, I realize how frustrating it is, yeah. but there are resources. Canadian Mental Health Association on Prince Street. Yeah. That's a great resource. Yeah. There's the Colchester Sexual Assault Center. If there's sexual trauma yeah. that may be contributing to mental illness, there are resources out there. Yes. It's just, unfortunately, a lot of work to find. them. And I think it's so hard to, when it's something that you feel like you have to prove. I broke my arm. You're exactly. going to very easily be able to tell that I broke my arm. That's right. Even if you don't x-ray, you can probably tell, but you know what? Put an x-ray up and you can tell I broke my arm. X-ray. You can't x-ray my, my brain. brain. MR on my brain and you're not going to notice a thing from anyone else's. That's right. And then what happens, I think, too, is if you start getting questioned, then you start questioning your own. Exactly. Like, I'm not, quote unquote, bad enough. Exactly. To be here or to be treated in the mental health ward or fill in the blank of whatever that is. So it just starts to play on that whole. And then when you start telling yourself, I'm not sick enough to be treated here, 
then it becomes, well, maybe I'm not that sick at all. Maybe I'm just Debbie Downer. Right. Yeah. And so you keep trying to talk yourself out of the mental illness. That's right. And that's not doing a darn thing. It's, it is a vicious cycle and it's hard. It's those invisible illnesses. It's hard when, you know, that's a 100% invisible illness because you can't even see it on an MRI. So no. well, I it's the same as someone who's going to their doctor and presenting symptoms that, or someone who's trying to explain to someone they have fibromyalgia, for example. Right. Yeah. You can't see. That's right. There's nothing to specifically see. Yeah. And they have to explain themselves all the time. Yeah. Unfortunately, and they shouldn't have to. But that is the way it is with mental illness, too, because it, like you said, it's it's invisible physically. There's nothing that you see yeah. unless it's manifesting in self harm or something like that. For sure, right? But, but then if you're engaging in that, yeah. odds are you're hiding it. I did. I wore long sleeves when it was 35 degrees outside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's such a hard. It really and it's gotten better. The the system is getting better, but there's so much more work that has to be done. And, oh, for sure. Yeah. I think we're much more better in terms of talking about it publicly and encouraging people to get help but when it's the actual help like everything else in the healthcare system there is a significant need for more resources yeah. more people yeah and there has to be a better way of agencies not just government but agencies as well of getting their information out there yeah. so that people are aware of the resources 100 percent, and having and uh, this is not because they partially fund the podcast but the mental health foundation of nova scotia as well as canadian mental health association are both doing a lot of great work in getting the word out and in reaching rural areas you talked about being in like you know, a very well, there is an even bigger stigma in rural areas for sure. One hundred percent. And I know that those organizations are working hard to do that, but it, you know, it's a beast of a thing, and there just needs to be more, 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 more awareness and and less stigma. Um, I just want to end, I've kept you longer than I promised. I apologize. That's because I talk. That's all on me, trust me. <laughs> I want to end because you had said you have tools that you can sort of pull from. Mm -hmm. Um that you've done in, in group therapy. Is there something if you're in it or you're feeling yourself going down that path, is there a quote or something that you pull from that, that kind of helps you in the moment to kind of, I know it's not an easy thing. One breath, one moment. Just get through that. One breath. Just get through that. And to remember that whatever moment you're in right now, you never have to relive that moment again. When this is over, this is over. You don't have to go through this moment again. I have goosebumps on that one. I love that. You can pull it out whenever you whenever you need it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for chatting today. Thank you. It was for, for such inviting a great conversation. Me. And I appreciate you opening up and being honest and yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this podcast because like, your 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 podcasts are extremely important in helping to spread this message around mental wellness mm -hmm. and helping people access resources. So thank you. Thanks again to the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia for supporting this podcast. Thank you once again to Mandy Wood for sharing her story and for being so open and vulnerable. And again, if you need support, please, please, please reach out.